day, and welcome to Howard Hughes Holdings' second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising that your hand has been raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce Senior Vice President of Investor Relations, Eric Holcomb. Good morning from our headquarters here in the Woodlands, Texas, and welcome to Howard Hughes Holdings' second quarter 2024 earnings call. With me today are David O'Reilly, Chief Executive Officer, Jay Cross, President, Carlos Olea, Chief Financial Officer, Dave Strife, President of Asset Management and Operations, and Joe Villain, General Counsel. Before we begin, I would like to direct you to our website, howardhughes.com, where you can download both our second quarter earnings press release and our supplemental package. The earnings release and supplemental package include reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures that will be discussed today in relation to their most directly comparable GAAP financial measures. Certain statements made today that are not in the present tense or that discuss the company's expectations are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. Although the company believes that the expectations reflected in such forward-looking statements are based upon reasonable assumptions, we can give no assurance that these expectations will be achieved. Please see the forward-looking statements disclaimer in our second quarter earnings press release and the risk factors in our SEC filings for factors that could cause material differences between forward-looking statements and actual results. We are not under any duty to update forward-looking statements unless required by law. I will now turn the call over to our CEO, David O'Reilly. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second quarter earnings call. On our call today, I'm going to begin with a recap of the quarter and cover the segment highlights for our master plan communities in the seaport. Dave Strike will cover the performance of our operating assets, followed by remarks from Jay Cross, who will provide updates on our strategic development projects. Finally, Carlos Alea will review our latest full year guidance and the balance sheet before we open up the lines for Q&A. For the second quarter, I'm pleased to report that Howard Hughes delivered exceptional results across our core business segments, highlighting the strong demand we continue to see in our master plan communities and further solidifying our strong 2024 outlook. Looking quickly around the segments, in NPCs, we continue to see heightened demand for new acreage from home builders, which contributed to a significant increase in residential land sales across our communities. These land sales achieved a new record average price per acre leading to robust MPC EBT that puts us well on our path to meet our full year guidance. Our operating assets delivered solid NOI, led by strong performance in office, as well as meaningful year-over-year -year growth in retail and multifamily. And strategic developments, buyer interest for our premier condos in Ward Village and the Woodlands remained at elevated levels. In the quarter, we contracted to sell 94 units, which equates to future revenue of $207 million. We're still on track for a fourth quarter delivery of Victoria Place, which we now expect will see more condo units close in 2024. With these outstanding results, we have reiterated our full year guidance for MPC EBT and raised our guidance for operating asset NOI and condo sales. Carlos will discuss more later in the call. Diving into our MPC segment results, we delivered outstanding MPC EBT of $123 million in the second quarter underscored by the sale of 164 acres of residential land across our communities at a new record high average price per acre of $1 million. Land sales were led by Summerlin, where we closed on the sale of 87 acres of super pads at an impressive $1.5 million per acre. Land sales in Texas were also strong, with 77 acres sold in Bridgeland and the Woodland Hills, representing a 55% increase year over year. Overall, land sales revenue totaled $155 million in the quarter, or a 266% increase year over year. New home sales, which we believe are a leading indicator of future land sales, maintain the strong momentum seen in recent quarters, with a total of 579 homes sold in our NPCs. Although down a modest 4% from the prior year, when home sales experienced a significant resurgence, Year-to-date home sales are pacing 7% higher. 
Looking forward, we remain confident in the strength of the new home market, despite recent national headlines reporting rising new home inventories and reduced new home sales. New home inventories, which were recently reported to have risen to over nine months nationally, can be a misleading metric because this metric includes homes that have not begun construction, homes under construction, and the homes that are actually completed. Looking at only the completed inventory, you'll find that there are actually less than two months of completed inventory available in the overall market, far fewer than the headline data suggests. In our communities, completed new home inventories have been in decline since year end and are currently one month or less in Bridgeland and Summerlin. With respect to new home sales, which were recently reported to have softened, we have found that reported data has been consistently adjusted higher in subsequent periods, questioning the accuracy of the initial reports. Our company's favorable view is further supported by our home builder partners, who continue to report strong results, healthy home buyer interest, significant increases in new orders, and low cancellation rates. Overall, the new home market remains incredibly resilient, and mortgage applications for new homes continue to rise despite high interest rates. We expect this to continue for several reasons. First and foremost is affordability. For the first time in several decades, home pricing is flipped, with new home pricing now cheaper than resale pricing. Together with attractive builder incentives, including mortgage rate buy-downs, monthly payments on new homes are simply more attractive to home buyers. New homes offer superior build quality, require less upkeep, have lower insurance costs, and provide higher building efficiency, all keeping costs lower. Availability and move-in ready inventory are also important factors. New homes now represent nearly one-third of total inventory, more than double historic averages, as homeowners remain reluctant to trade in their historically low mortgages. This trend is not likely to reverse without significant rate cuts, as the average homeowner has a mortgage rate of 4% or less. As a result, existing home sales have slowed to their lowest level since the great financial crisis. The new home market share has risen to its highest percentage. With elevated demand for new homes, as well as a significant undersupply of vacant developed lots, which remain well below equilibrium in our communities and their surrounding MSAs, we anticipate continued strong home builder demand for our land going forward. For that reason, we expect a strong second half of 2024 which will contribute to record residential land sales and robust NPC EBT of approximately $300 million for the full year. Turning to the Seaport, as we announced last week, our board of directors approved the spinoff and the distribution of Seaport Entertainment shares to HHH holders of record at the close of business on this coming Monday, July 29th. The distribution is expected after market close on Wednesday, July 31st, with HHH shareholders receiving one share of Seaport Entertainment Common Stock for every nine shares of HHH Common Stock. Seaport Entertainment will begin trading under the ticker SEG on the NYSE American Stock Exchange on Thursday, August 1st. Looking at their financials, the Seaport generated net operating losses of $9.4 million in the second quarter. This reflected a $6.9 million year-over-year -year incremental loss primarily due to costs associated with the stand-up of Seaport Entertainment and reduced revenues as a result of poor weather, including equity losses of $5.6 million, primarily from the tin building. Total Seaport NOI was a loss of $15 million. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dave Strife for a review of our operating assets. Thank you, David. Good morning. In the second quarter, the strong momentum that has been building in our operating assets segment continued with the delivery of $68 million of NOI, including the contribution from unconsolidated ventures. This represented a 1% year-over-year reduction driven in part by $4 million of office lease termination fees received in the prior year. Excluding this benefit in the prior year, operating assets NOI was up 5%. Our strong performance was led by office which reported $33 million of NOI this quarter. Excluding those lease termination fees of $4 million in the prior year, office NOI increased $3 million, representing a 12% year-over-year increase, a strong improvement given the backdrop of a difficult office market nationwide. During the quarter, we continued our leasing success with the execution of 
145,000 square feet of new or expanded office leases. With our stabilized office portfolio now 89% leased, we expect to benefit from this leasing momentum in 2025 as office build-outs are completed and free rent periods burn off. During the quarter, we acquired Waterway Plaza 2, a 142,000 square foot Class A office building located in the Woodlands Town Center for approximately $19 million. This reflected a purchase price of approximately $135 per square foot for the office space, not considering the value of the associated land and the adjacent parking garage. With our Woodlands Town Center office portfolio essentially fully leased, this asset adds much needed inventory and is expected to achieve a double digit return upon stabilization. In addition, with over three prime acres in the heart of the Woodlands, this acquisition creates an unparalleled covered land play with a low cost basis and exceptional long term opportunities for future redevelopment. The multifamily portfolio also performed very well in the quarter, delivering an NOI of $14 million, or an 8% year over year increase. This growth was primarily driven by increased rental revenue associated with the lease up of our newest properties, including Starling at Bridgeland, Marlowe in downtown Columbia, and Tanager Echo in Summerlin. These properties have seen impressive leasing success during the last year, with Starling now 94% leased, Marlowe at 74%, and Tanager Echo 67% leased. During the time when multifamily rents have seen pressure in many markets across the country, our rents remain stable with 1% growth across the portfolio, further demonstrating the strength and quality of our assets and our highly desirable master plan communities. Overall, we are pleased with these results and we expect further multifamily NOI growth as the year progresses. In retail, NOI was $15 million in the second quarter, which increased 19% year over year. This improvement was primarily driven by the collection of prior period reserves at Ward Village. With our retail portfolio 94% leased, we expect full-year NOI growth in 2024. With that, I'll turn the call over to our President, Jay Cross. Thanks, Dave, and good morning, everyone. In strategic developments, we had another great quarter, achieving several important milestones. First, in Nevada, we completed Meridian, our 148,000-square-foot office building adjacent to the proposed movie studio site in Summerlin. Since its completion, tenant interest has been steady, with half of the complex currently under advanced LOI or in lease negotiations. In Maryland, we also completed 10285 Lakefront, our first medical office building in downtown Columbia. This 85,000 square foot project is currently 48% leased and another 28% under LOI or in negotiations. In this quarter, we celebrated the start of construction on two new projects, including one Bridgeland Green, the first mass timber office building in the Houston area and in our entire portfolio. This innovative 49,000 square foot project, which we expect will be completed next year, has seen high demand. As of this week, it was already 80% pre-leased with another 7% under LOI. In Hawaii, we commenced construction on Kauai, a 329-unit front row condo tower across from Kiwala Harbor in Ward Village. This project, which is expected to be completed in 2027, is impressively 92% pre-sold, with only 26 units remaining in inventory. With Kauai, we now have four condo projects under construction in Hawaii, together with Victoria Place, Yulana, and the Park Ward Village, which are scheduled to be completed in late 2024, late 2025, and mid-2026, respectively. These four towers are collectively 97% pre-sold and represent meaningful future revenue of $2.6 billion, which will be recognized as these projects are delivered. Looking at condo sales, as David mentioned, we had an outstanding second quarter. In Ward Village, we contracted 78 condos, representing incremental future revenue of approximately $140 million. The majority of these pre-sales related to the Lanu, our 11th condo project in Ward Village. Since its launch in the first quarter, demand for this 485-unit project has been solid, with pre-sales eclipsing 50% of total units by quarter end. And finally, in Texas, following the extremely successful launch of the Ritz-Carlton Residences, the Woodlands, in the last week of March, 
we sold an additional 16 condos in the second quarter. This 111-unit luxury project is now 65% pre-sold with contracted future revenues of $313 million. We expect to start construction on this exciting development later this year. I would now like to hand the call over to our CFO, Carlos Oleo, who will review our guidance and the balance sheet. Thank you, Jay, and good morning, everyone. With an incredibly successful second quarter, we look to continue the momentum that we have experienced across our core segments and we remain confident that 2024 will be a strong year. Today, we reiterate our MTC, EDT, and GNA guidance, and we increase our operating asset and condo sales guidance for the year. As David mentioned earlier, in our MTC segment, we continue to project robust DVT of $300 million at the midpoint. This guidance contemplates record residential land sales with significant super fast sales in Summerlin during the third quarter and steady residential lot sales in Richland and the Woodland Hills throughout the second half of the year. As previously highlighted, year-over-year growth in residential land sales will be offset by reduced commercial land sales and builder price participation, as well as limited inventory of custom lot sales due to a significant past success of IRI in the Woodlands and the Summit in Summerlin. Because of the strong performance of our operating assets in the first half of 2024, most notably in office, we are increasing our outlook for the full year. Our previous range, which was expected to increase 1% to 4% year over year with a midpoint of approximately $250 million, is now expected to be in a range of up 3% to 6% year over year with a midpoint of approximately $255 million. This new guidance also contemplates the removal of approximately $1 million of NOI in the second half of 2024 related to the Las Vegas ballpark, which is being spun off with Seaport Entertainment. Condo sales revenues, which were previously expected to range between $675 and $725 million, with gross margins between 28 to 30%, are now expected to range between 730 and 750 million with gross margins of approximately 28%. Our guidance is almost given entirely by the completion of Victoria Place in the fourth quarter, which we now expect will see no residences close in 2024. Our new guidance contemplates approximately 30 to $50 million of condo sales revenue delaying into the first quarter of 2025 due to the timing of closings, compared to approximately $75 million in our previous guidance. And finally, we expect cash GMA to continue to range between $80 and $90 million for the full year. But it's important to note that this guidance excludes approximately $30 million of cash expenses to complete the spin-off of Seaport Entertainment, as well as approximately $8 million of anticipated non-cash stock compensation. Turning to our balance sheet, we had $437 million of cash at the end of the quarter. Together with our strong guidance expectations for the full year, we are well positioned to further strengthen our balance sheet and deploy capital appropriately. At the end of June, the remaining equity contribution needed to fund our current projects was approximately $277 million. From a debt perspective, we have $5.5 million outstanding with only $278 million of maturities in 2024. Approximately 271 of this 278 total is related to a construction loan on Victoria Place, which will be repaid as units close in the fourth quarter, leaving us in a strong position with only $7 million of principal amortization payments due in 2024. For 2025, we have approximately $431 million maturing after the successful $130 million refinancing of 9950 Woodlock Forest Drive with a five-year non-recourse loan at a fixed rate of approximately 7%. This loan produces up to 24% of our 2025 maturities, and the closing of this refinancing, particularly in today's challenging market, truly speaks to a strong demand we are seeing for office and the quality of our assets in the Woodlands. And finally, we also closed on a $420 million construction loan for Kalai. The non recourse loan bears interest at SOFA plus 5% with a maturity in 2027. 
This tower, which already has contracts representing $761 million of future revenue, further demonstrates our ability to create value with our condo projects in Ward Village with minimal cash equity. With that, I would now like to turn the call back over to David for closing remarks. Thank you, Carlos. Before we open up the lines for Q&A, I, I just want to remind everyone about our next Investor Day, which will be held in Summerlin at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Monday, November 18th, in conjunction with the NARI Investor Conference in Las Vegas. Invitations with registration information will be coming out soon, but please mark your calendars to join us. If you have specific questions in the meantime, please reach out to Eric Holt. In closing, our second quarter results were nothing short of outstanding across our core businesses, further solidifying what we expect will be another remarkable and record-breaking year for Howard Hughes. With this strong performance, we foresee record residential land sales and robust MPC EBT, record operating assets in NOI, and over $200 million of gross profit from condo sales for the full year. With a spinoff of Seaport Entertainment nearly completed, I want to take a minute and thank all of our many employees who have worked tirelessly to make the spinoff a success. And to the Seaport Entertainment team, we wish you all the best in your journey ahead. For Howard Hughes, we embark on an exciting new chapter in our history with a refined identity as a pure play real estate company solely focused on what we do best, building world-class master plan communities. With nearly 35,000 acres of unmasked land remaining in our portfolio, we have decades of opportunities for thoughtful growth and value creation ahead of us. With that, let's start the Q&A portion of the call. Thank Operator, you. can you open the line to our first question, please? Certainly. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 11 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. So withdraw your question. Question, please press star one one again. One moment, please. Our first question comes from the line of Alexander Goldfarb with Piper Sandler. Hey, uh, morning, morning down there, uh, David. With the uh, with the Seaport finally, you know, the spinoff finally here. Uh, just a few, uh, you know, I guess sort of math questions for you. So it's a twofold. One. Uh, can you just, you know, as we think about, I, th I think you said a $15 million NOI loss, but I think there was also sort of for book value, $9.4 million negative contribution from the seaport. So basically as we look forward to third quarter, obviously all the losses related to the seaport go away. It sounds like all the G&A uh, related to the spinoff are embedded in that seaport number. So I just want to make sure as we're thinking about you guys going forward that, you know, the seaport is really the entity that we want to remove from earnings, you know, and make sure we're not missing anything else in other parts of the of the income statement. And the second part is, can you just remind us the amount of capital, if any, that's going from Howard Hughes to the new seaport that's going to come off your balance sheet? Yeah, absolutely. I was happy to walk you through that. In fact, I'm going to ask Carlos to, to give you the color and detail on all that. Uh, is, is he's been living this in the weeds more than I have. Uh, but I do want to just clarify one thing as part of your question before Carlos takes the, takes the details. Um, next quarter, we won't be removing entirely, right, because this is going to be effective July 31st. So we will have one of the three months of 3Q inclusive of the results of Seaport before the spin is effective. Uh, so there will be a little bit of the news next quarter. It will be a lot less than this. Uh, and then in the fourth quarter, we will be reporting as a pure play MPC company, which for us is incredibly exciting. But Carlos? Yes, thank you, David. Uh, good morning, Alex. So, yes, when when the CPR goes effective on August 1st, the MPC that you see on our financials is the CPR segment is the part that will go away. Everything has been encapsulated there for quite some time to run as an autonomous segment, particularly in anticipation of the spinoff, because as you know, we have been reporting in a separate segment even before. But yes, whatever what you see in the in the CPO results is what will go away past the spin-off and nothing else. In in addition to to that, it is in the segment, but the ballpark and the the baseball team as well as, as we all know are going to go with the spin-off. And then the yeah, capital going from 
yeah, so as far as, as far as the cash infusion, there's going to be a 23 million cash infusion that will take place at, at the completion of the spin-off from us to uh, Seaport Entertainment. Okay. One and then time. Next, one time, okay. 23 million cash infusion. Okay. And then, David, going back to home sales, it's been quite a topic. You know, you've obviously been quoted in the press and on TV, you know, related to home sales. You referenced a two-month inventory. I, I'm not sure if that was just... Howard Hughes in general or nationwide, but maybe you could just talk a little bit more because this is something that we hear from the Bears, which is that, you know, the housing inventory is like the biggest it's been, you know, since the credit crisis, whatever, and then you look at other data which says, no, it's not, and to your point, you know, home sales remain, you know, healthy, and obviously it's all going to new homes. So maybe you could just parse out a bit more of, you know, some of the headline numbers that we see versus what you guys are actually seeing on the ground. And then also uh, on that inventory number, the two months, was that national or that's just your communities overall? Yeah, happy, happy to go a little deeper on that, Alex. I think it's super important. And I think often the headlines become incredibly misleading in terms of what's really happening. If we backed up the clock 60 days when – April home sales were first reported, we saw an initial number of about 634,000 homes, which was a year-over-year -year decline, and the headlines read doom and gloom. Roll forward the clock to about a week ago when June numbers were reported. In that report, the April number was revised to 730,000. That's a 15% upward revision in 60 days. If that original report had shown 730,000, we would have celebrated a year-over-year -year increase. But, you know, that, that just wasn't reported that way, you know, because the data wasn't as clear. Um, so I do think that we have to pay a little bit closer detail to, to what's underlying the data to make an informed decision. And then on home inventory, as, as that number gets reported, Alex, it consists of three things. It consists of lots that have been sold and contracted, it consists of homes that are under construction, which are, which are predominantly contracted and sold unless there's been a cancellation where builders are building spec, which they rarely do. And it includes completed new homes that are not sold that represent truly the spec inventory. If you just look at that spec inventory, the completed new homes, the third leg of the stool that I just described, nationally that's at a two-month number. In our portfolio, in Summerlin, it's at half a month, and in Brisbane, it's at one month. So this, this overhang of completed spec home inventory that's sitting there is not nearly the negative headline that I think we see reported nationally. I think it's very manageable. I think it's an appropriate level, and in fact, it's relatively tight compared to historic norms. We really see that number spike, and we saw that number increase when interest rates ticked higher rapidly and the cancellations flowed through the home builder books. That created a much higher number of completed new home inventory than anything close to what we're seeing today. Okay. And just the final question on the Ritz at the Woodlands. Uh, happy to hear more, more pre-sales there. Last quarter you talked about holding, you know, a, a meaningful amount of the units off market until the end, which is in contrast to the way that you sold you know, condos out in Ward Village. Are you guys rethinking the, the Ritz project and now going more towards selling the bulk of the units now rather than waiting till the end just to de-risk? Or are you still looking to hold out uh, a chunk of the units till the end? You know, our strategy hasn't changed, Alex. We've taken almost all the remaining units off the market with the, with the exception of a handful. The handful that we do have listed and available through the sales team and our sales gallery here in the Woodlands We've increased prices pretty dramatically um, in an effort to do honestly slow sales until we finish the building and, and can show off the quality of what we built because we think that the pricing will go higher at that point in time. Uh, despite the efforts of increasing pricing and listing only a few units, the team has still sold units. I, I, you know, like, I, even sometimes the best efforts to go unrewarded, I suppose. Um, so, look, I, I think that our strategy hasn't shifted in Hawaii. Our strategy is a bit different, and you're 100% right, because, you know, we have over 10 towers to sell there, 
And the ability to deliver value to shareholders is not just about squeezing the last dollar of price, but about speed and the net present value of delivering towers over time. So getting them sold out and sold quickly allows us to launch that next tower immediately. In the rivers, perhaps we might have another tower someday, but today we have one. And it's the best building on the best site in one of the best master plan communities in the country. And I think that by taking a thoughtful, pragmatic approach on the sellout of that building, we're going to deliver excess value to our shareholders rather than rifle through and sell it as fast as we can. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. One moment, please, for our next question. <laughs> and our next question comes from the line of Anthony Pallone with J.P. Morgan. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, can you maybe talk to us about just how to think about capital allocation perhaps over the next 12 to 18 months because the cash drag from Seaport's going to be gone. Um, you've got a lot of upcoming condo sales kind of locked up. The MPCs are performing well. So it just seems like you're going to have incremental cash. And how should we think about that and perhaps the pecking order even as it relates to, you know, maybe buying back stock even? You know, it, Tony, it's a great question. It's something that we debate all the time, not just within the C-suite, but within our board in terms of how we allocate that capital to drive our, the intrinsic value of our company on a per share basis higher every day. And, you know, today, given inflationary pressures on construction costs, rental rate growth that has not kept up with those, new development becomes harder and harder. And as a result, I think you've seen us take a more rifle shot approach to those new development projects. Really focused on those highest return opportunities, a la condos in Hawaii, the Ritz-Carlton here, potentially sitting on some dry powder for uh, if we're able to get the, the, the law passed in Nevada to do the studios. Um, and, and I think that as those development returns have gotten squeezed, the opportunity to create value through share buybacks raises higher up the list. And as we see incremental capital onto our books, share buybacks become a more real and an executable opportunity than, you know, a couple of years ago when we were knocking off multifamilies across our portfolio at an 8% return on cost in a 4% cap rate environment, right? That, that environment doesn't exist today, and as a result, we have to be thoughtful, pragmatic, and, and take a more rightful shot approach to how we unlock the value of our raw commercial land with new developments. Okay, thanks for that. And then, uh, you mentioned the studios, and that, that was on, on my list as well. So is there any update to the Nevada legislation there or them potentially holding a special you know, session to get that, that moving? And also, what should we think about as sort of being the equity that, that HHH will need to, to kind of do that deal? So um, the studio bill as it sits right now is actually being drafted uh, by one of our by great senators in the state of Nevada. And the intent is that we can hopefully get that bill on to the legislative session when we come back into session in February. I think given the election year dynamics and some of the local politics going on in the state, it would be unlikely to see a special session called between now and November. Um, and then the time frame with holidays after the November election before they actually go back officially in February is so tight, a special session is also unlikely then. So we're really focused and we're really putting all of our efforts towards getting ready for the February legislative session. And, and we're very hopeful and optimistic that we can try to get something done early on in that session. Um, in terms of the amount of capital that we would need for that project, that's going to depend entirely on how much of the bill gets passed because that will drive the sizing of the studio, um, which will drive the overall cost of the studio. But if you thought about a project in the, you know, 450 to 500 ish million dollar range uh, in a typical 60 ish percent construction loan. That remaining equity requirement would be what would be, um, I don't want to say split because it implies even, but shared between Sony and Howard Hughes. Okay, thanks. Those are helpful brackets. And then just last one, if I can. Um, you, know, you mentioned the, the strong pricing in the MPC segment this, this quarter and, and the, you know, 
unit pricing was stronger than we expected as well. Can you talk about just maybe like how much that might have been just mix in terms of what got sold versus you know real price appreciation, say year over year? Um, look, I, I think that that we saw a pretty dramatic year over year price appreciation as it relates to residential land in some of them. Um, and to see us get to, you know, a $1.5 million per acre um, across multiple super pads and 87 acres in some of them, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's nothing short of remarkable. And uh, the team out in some of them continues to surprise me every day with their execution. Uh, across our other communities, and if you look at page 26 of the supplemental, uh, you see some decent growth. Uh, in Bridgeland from 515 acres to almost 590, uh, and in, in a 10 plus percent increase in price per acre in the Woodland Hills at about 408 to 450 thousand dollars. So, I, it, it mix helps uh, because we sold a lot in Summerlin at one and a half million an acre, and less in Woodland Hills at 450. But if you dig into each one of the NPCs, you can see price per acre appreciation, which was pretty strong. Okay, thanks for the time. A nice quarter. Thank you, Tony. It was a pleasure. Thank you. One moment, please, for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of John Kim with BMO Capital Markets. Good morning. Uh, on, on the MPC guidance that you left unchanged, uh, David, you talk a lot about the strong results and momentum, uh, but the second half of the year is basically um, implying that it's flat with the first half. Um, and in a declining interest rate environment as well. Um, is the reason why you kept it unchanged based on uncertainty of super lot uh, timing, or are there other uh, factors uh, that's driving that? Uh, well, look, look um, maybe I'm uh, overly cautious or, or overly conservative, but our guidance already implies the best year ever in the history of residential land sales for Howard Hughes. Um, and while, you know, the second half of the year, the implication for the second half of the year is very consistent with what we delivered in the first half of the year, the first half of the year was nothing short of remarkable. Uh, to stretch even beyond that for the second half of the year in an environment that, you know, does have some question marks about it, um, I think it may just be a little bit over aggressive. And look, I, I pride myself, and I know this organization prides itself, on under-promising and over-delivering. And as a result, I think that we want to take a proven approach and hang our hat on the best year of the history of Howard Hughes on residential land sales. And how much of an impact has uh, interest rates had? You know, in the last month, it's been trending down, and it's been pretty volatile year-to-date. But uh, in your conversations with home builders, um, how has the last uh, 30 days or so trended? Look, I, I would say the home sales have been strong and consistent throughout the second quarter and throughout the first quarter. I don't. I, I wouldn't tell you that home sales have picked up with a modest decrease in mortgage rates. They've been very consistent with the previous months. Uh, we're also getting into this slower summer season, um, so maybe that this is actually a, a positive relative to past years, but. I, you know, I don't, I don't see an uptick. I haven't seen an increase in demand as a, the, the, given the prognosis of lower rates coming into the second half of the year or the slight downtick in underlying mortgage rates. I think it's just been pretty consistently strong, which for us is great news. On the uh, Seaport, this may be the last time you comment on it, but um, looking at revenue this year versus last year, it's, it's come down. Uh, Tim buildings and events have come down as well, which is a bit surprising. What do you think um, turns it around, maybe under new management? But what, what do you think could turn that around going forward? Well, I, I think that some new or newer headwinds we've seen have been weather-related. I think there's been a drop in sponsorship uh, and event revenue business really across the board, and I don't think that's Seaport specific. And as I pulled a lot of the other public company results of public companies that own restaurants for a living, there's been a lot of pressure. I think spending has been down, and spending has been down on restaurants and food and beverage in New York. I think the team there has done an incredible job right-sizing the overhead, bringing in the right talent to run that organization, focus on maximizing margins, profitability, food costs, labor costs, and that takes time. It's not a magic wand overnight. It, it is a 
months and quarter, quarters process to get it exactly right. And I think Anton has the skills and talent, and the team is entirely focused. And I really think it's just a matter of time before that business starts humming the way we all wanted it to today. Uh, and, but it will just take that the skill set of that management team to really unlock that value. Okay. And my final question is on your commercial portfolio, uh, specifically office, which you had good uh, leasing uh, momentum this quarter. Looking out over the next 12 to 18 months, you have a modest amount of office lease expirations, about 8% uh, 8 through 2025. How do you see occupancy trending uh, during this time frame? And if you can comment on the acquisition you made uh, during the quarter, why do we apply for two? Why, why buy more inventory in office? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely great questions. So I think that if you, if you look back at the office portfolio performance for the quarter and you remove the $4 million of lease term fees from the prior year, we actually saw a 12% year over year increase in our office portfolio, which well, I'm pretty proud and excited about. And then as you look at what's been signed but hasn't commenced, you know, we have about $8 million of leases that are in abatement periods in 2024 alone. And if you go back to what's been signed across the portfolio that will kick in over 24 and 25, that number grows to $19 million. So while we have expirations, and, and you know, I think everybody has expirations, I think ours are very manageable. I think we have a great portfolio that is in demand as demonstrated by the increase in occupancy across the board at 89% um, and a lot of positive momentum, momentum uh, and leasing that will kick in and cash in a lot throughout 24 and 25. I think that 89% over the course of the next 18 months trends higher given the demand that we've seen and continue to see in the leasing momentum that we're executing on, uh, specifically here in the Woodlands. Uh, and to that end, you know, Waterway Plaza 2 mm -hmm. is right here in the heart of downtown on the waterway, where our portfolio here is essentially full at 96%. And we have demand. This property at 142,000 square feet, it's a little over 50% lease, provides an immediate day one incredible cash on cash yield on our purchase. And a plan stabilization, which we think we can achieve very quickly, gets us into the double digits on an unlevered basis and returns that, honestly, I can't replicate in our development portfolio today. And if I think about where we're going to get the highest Risk-adjusted returns on capital invested, share buybacks, as I mentioned earlier, is, is on the list. But buying a building, a Class A building in the heart of the waterway where we have more demand than vacant space and can execute very quickly on a lease-up strategy and deliver a double-digit unlevered cash on cash return is one that we couldn't pass up. And if you think about it long-term, over, over the next couple of decades, to have this three-acre site in the heart of the woodlands for potential redevelopment uh, at this basis is is just, like I think it was mentioned in the prepared remarks by Dave Stripe, two of the best cover of the name plays, you know, I've seen in my career. Um, and, you know, look, that doesn't even include the value that we got for free with the adjacent dirt and the parking garage. So it, we're super excited. I know this is a contrarian view, and, and we shouldn't be buying office because everyone says all office is dead. But the results in our portfolio speak otherwise. And the opportunity to drive value creation for our shareholders is at the top of the list and higher than just about any other, other opportunity we've seen in our portfolio over the past couple of quarters. And as a result, we couldn't pass on it. What was that initial uh, cap rate on the acquisition? Uh, I don't believe we've reported that due to the confidential uh, nature of our, our purchase and sale agreement with the seller. I think next quarter, when you actually see the NOI as we report it in the supplemental, everyone will be able to back into what we think is a, a cap rate at 55% that looks and smells and feels like a market cap rate for a full building. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. One moment, please, for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Peter Abramowitz with Jeffries. Thank you, and thanks for the time. Uh, just a question on the MPC and, and the full year guidance. Uh, you, you kept that, uh, ma maintain that in the same range. 
Um, and you kind of seem to be on track based on your earlier comments from, from earlier in the year about the super pad sales in Summerlin. I, I guess just taking a step back, what would make you comfortable or what would you need to see to sort of raise that guidance, uh, particularly given how strong uh, second quarter was? Uh, look, I, I think that we have to see an acceleration in new home sales, which would lead me to believe that builders are going to buy more dirt than what I think they currently have the appetite for. I think that another factor that led into us keeping guidance where it is is the flattening or the slowing of increased home prices. Right over the past two years, Peter, if you go back to our MPC EBT, a meaningful component of that MPC EBT has been increased builder price participation, largely as a result of the acceleration of home prices across of our communities. As that acceleration is slowing and home prices are modestly increasing or staying flat, builder price participation is coming down, and therefore our, our MPC EBT guidance is largely driven by just price per acre and number of acres sold, which is highly correlated to underlying home sales. And while home sales are strong, they're also delivering you know, a record year for us of residential land sales across the portfolio, which is what's implied in that guidance. Uh, again, I think an increase in home sales and an increase in demand from builders for more dirt could give us the confidence to increase that guidance or a sharp uptick in price of the homes, which would give us confidence in builder price appreciation. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you, David. Uh, and then one other, I, I guess John sort of asked it, but to look at it from maybe a, a longer-term perspective, uh, you're 83%-ish occupied in office today and uh, in the high 80s from a leased occupancy perspective. Uh, I guess just if, as you look at your, your office portfolio overall, kind of w w with the market sort of seeming to inflect maybe slowly, but at least is getting better, um, how, how should we think about kind of stabilized long-term occupancy potential in, in the office portfolio? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, downtown here in the Woodlands, we're at 96. Overall in the Woodlands, we're about 90. And the vacancy is concentrated in some great buildings at One News Landing uh, that, that unfortunately had some bankruptcy. Um, I, I can imagine our Woodlands portfolio easily getting into the low 90s and, you know, maybe not back to the 96, 97 that we enjoyed pre-pandemic, but absolutely into the low 90s. Uh, across Vegas, um, we're already at, at a really stabilized occupancy level with one, two, Summerlin, and uh, 1,700 almost entirely full. Uh, and what's not least is in negotiation right now. I think it's about 95%. Uh, do I think we can stay 95% forever? I hope so, but that's a pretty fancy number. Uh, and then we have a, a bit of vacancy concentrated in the Columbia portfolio in the, the Whether well, the row assets, the newer assets are almost entirely full, it's really the corporate row assets, the older assets that have some vacancy as the smaller tenants there have um, decided to work from home uh, in greater numbers than what we've seen in the other areas of our portfolio. And I would say that over the past 90 days, to your point in the question that you asked, we've seen a little bit of infection where we're seeing more new incremental demand than we are seeing downsizing and move outs. And that's a nice turn that we haven't seen in that older Columbia office buildings. Um, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a minute since we've seen that, so it's nice over this past quarter to see some incremental demand that we think will drive that higher over the coming quarters. All right, that, that's all for me. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. One moment, please, for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Alex Barron with Housing Research Center. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the timing of condo closings. Um, Victoria Place, I believe, is started uh, is scheduled to start in the in the fourth quarter. But I was wondering, do you anticipate most of the closings to happen that quarter, or will it, a lot of them spill over into 2025? Uh, and so, Alex, I mean, it's a good question, and it's one that I believe Carlos tried to uh, mention in his prepared remarks. Um, one of the things that we did with our guidance this quarter was increase our condo sales revenue guidance. And a piece of that increase, a meaningful piece of that increase, 
is that we expect less of the Victoria Place closings to be in 2025 than we previously did. Our previous guidance expected $75 million of condo closings from Victoria Place to fall into 2025. And today's new guidance contemplates approximately 30 to $50 million. So the construction there is going very well. We have a lot of confidence in our buyers there. It's 100% sold out that we think that we can get the vast majority of those units done in 2024 and less and less potentially slipping into 2025. Okay, thanks. And then on the next tower, Ulana in 2025, do you have an approximate quarter when that one's scheduled to close? And is my understanding correct that that one will be maybe break even or at a slight uh, no profit because it's workforce? Correct. Your, your inclination, uh, Ulana, is a workforce that is not a profit driver. It's a break even ish tower. I think that when we provide guidance for 2025, we'll be able to give you some better timing on when to expect uh, those closings. But again, that, you know, that would be a, uh, a cash benefit, but not an earnings benefit, as you highlighted that it is a workforce housing tower. Okay, awesome. And then if I could ask one more. Um, on Summerland, you guys usually sell one big chunk of super pads. Um, historically, I think it's been more in the fourth quarter, but this time you had a big sale this quarter. So. Does that mean there's going to be potentially not, not that much more revenues coming out of Summerland in the back half of the year or not necessarily? No, I, 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 I believe that we will see a very strong third quarter in Summerland. There are more super pads sold uh, that, will, you know, that will keep us a great third quarter. I think that you know the fourth quarter this year, unlike as you highlighted, the past several years, the fourth quarter has kind of been a big quarter for Summerland. May be quiet because... Uh, of the acceleration of takedowns of these super pads by our builders that are desperate for land to meet that demand that's in the market uh, and let them to close on these pads and want this dirt uh, in their portfolio in the second and third quarter. Got it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Oz. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now hand the call back over to CEO David O'Reilly for any closing remarks. We appreciate everyone's participation as always and hope that uh, all of you can join us for our investor day uh, it's, uh, right around maybe uh, this November in Summerlin. Uh, and maybe we should have all of our earnings calls on Friday morning because I think we have more questions today than we've had in a long time. We really appreciate the participation. Thanks for all of your interest. And if there's any follow-up questions, we're always available. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating. This concludes today's program, and you may now disconnect.